you'd gone to university and mm. came out of North Korea. Then you went to university in South Korea. So you got yeah. you got to see that culture yeah. as an outsider. Mm -hmm. And then you came to the United States and you got to see Columbia University. So what did you conclude about your time in Columbia University? What are your what were your impressions? What do you have to say to people about what you saw? And then you, oh my gosh, so that four years from 2016 to 2020, um, it was a complete madness. I, I became very pessimistic about the Western world after university because like, so <laughs> literally in this humanity classes, even the eco economics, I was studying economics for two years and later human rights. They, the professor would send me the like uh, emails. Oh, this this class we're gonna cover this this. If it triggers you, you don't have to come to the class or don't even do the reading. I'm a rape survivor. I'm a slave. I go through so many things, and they say, oh, this can trigger the rape. This can trigger this, and then like they every before the class they say, let's go through what do you wanna be called your pronouns. And my English is not that good. I sometimes mistakenly call him or she like, and then they start asking me to say they, and then I don't know how to incorporate in my English that pronoun properly. And it made me so nervous to talk in the classroom. And one day I got into fight with my professor. She was saying, uh, you know, the fact that you're letting men holding door for you is you are giving in to their overpowering you. And I was like, no, it's need kindness, it's decency. I hold the door for people too. It's not like I'm trying to signal that I'm powerful than you. And she was like, I mean, you're so brainwashed from North Korea. Like, and I was a senior, of course my GPA is gonna be affected. And it's like, okay, I gotta really try to, I gotta try to do my best to get a good GPA. So that four years, I learned to censor myself all over again. And it became ridiculous. Like I That's literally, terrible. exactly. Like I literally risked my life to say what I think is right. And now I'm like, you know, contributor four years of time, try how to be create a safe space and be sensitive enough. So, and like, where am I? Like where, and it gave me a lot of um, chaos. Like, did I become free? Like, was it, where am I? Is there any truly free place in this world right now? Well, okay. So you, you were in this university in Korea mm -hmm. and Korean universities are intense. And so yes. how would you contrast the quality of the education that you received? And they're very Western influenced, the, the mm -hmm. South Korean university. Mm -hmm. So they're a product of the Western university system. So how would you contrast your experience at the South Korean university with Columbia, which is in, in principle, one of the great Western American institutions, educational institutions? It's, so I do think South Korea is way more technical. They are way more into trying to teach you the skill set. Like if, you know, more giving you actual knowledge, but Okay, I think Americans are very obsessed. I, that was my impression at Colombia. We're really trying to help you how to think, but almost like you want to shape how you think. They are very into shaping your minds, how you think about something. In South Korean study program was more like, oh, this is a fact. This is what happened in history. This is what we're gonna do. This is a modern we're gonna apply to solve this criminal case. Like, you know, this is how things work. But lately, though, when it comes to sociology, uh, it's been very influenced by the Western, like the mainstream education. So a lot of uh, anti-Western uh, sentiments was definitely there. And it's just, I- In I, Korea as well. Oh yes, definitely. All those like sociology and those subjects is definitely influenced. And South Korea is now becoming a communist again. Definitely. It's, it, it is a sad trend to see that like right now, South Korean youth demand socialism and, you know, freedom is so fragile, like it's, it's never gonna be there if you don't fight for it. And South Korea's democracy is falling and their speech, freedom of speech right now in South Korea, like doctor, if you send those leaflets that we used to send to North Korea to free people's minds. So we used to send those leaflets about like, you Kim's are dictators, you are being lied. 
and that was a freedom separate expression that was covered by South Korean constitution. But now that just got became criminalized in South Korea, like last few months ago. What exactly was criminalized? Uh, advocating freedom in North Korea. Because South Korea, in the, but their defense is that because we, if we say we support freedom in North Korea, then North Korean regime saying we are going to start a war over you about that. So for the protecting South Korean people's freedom, you cannot advocate freedom for North Korean people in the South Korea. And what do you think about <laughs> This is another thing. There's going to be a price for being silent about something like this happening, right? It's a, uh, if, if they can come for this, well, how do we know they are not going to go after other rights? That's how it, all this cycle begins. So it is definitely dangerous what they're taking to keep saying in the name of protection, in the name of this, we are going to silence you. We're going to silence this, this, this. And that's what North Korea did, right? In the name of equality, pure, pure equality, you're going to get rid of, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of gathering, all of this. And now they're left with nothing. Only people are allowed to do is just breathing. So why did you stay at Columbia? Uh, it was a, it was my father's dream for me to be college educated. He, I found it was not worth it. It was so to this day degree that it was so right. sorry. It was so it was a waste of time, energy, and money. Really, <laughs> that's a terrible yeah. thing. That's terrible. It was. It, it's I, honestly, I tell like my son that if you want to study humanity in one of these universities, I'm never gonna pay for it. Like I'm so clear on that to my son. But, I'm so embarrassed <laughs> about that. I'm so no. embarrassed about that. It's Gosh. so awful to hear that. Those universities, they were great, you know. They were great. Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. And it's not that long ago that they were great, that they did what they said they were going to do. And if you went and got a humanities education, you got educated. You learned to write. You learned to think. You learned history. You learned to be cultured. That happened. It wasn't that long ago. It was When I went to university, it was still like that. When I taught at Harvard, it was still like that. There were politically correct murmurings and rumblings, but by and large, the university was still uncorrupted. And, it, and the humanities are at the core of the university. If they're corrupted, if they go, if they've gone in the way that you're already describing, there's no way the universities can survive. They're not technical schools. The, the core of the university was the humanities. I mean, look at, what jo look at what Animal Farm did for you. That's what reading great books does for people. You know, it, it, it illuminates their soul. It's not mm -hmm. optional. And I'm so appalled that that was your experience at Columbia. It's so awful that you went through all that and managed to get to this great university. And, <laughs> you know, and that, and that you had to shut yourself down and that your basic conclusion was that it was a waste of time. Now, did you have courses where that wasn't the case? Did you have courses that were worth it? I, I, I mean, so one class I remember in my senior year, it was called the Western Civilization, the music art. art one of the core that Columbia had is the Western art. And the music. has still, right. not for and, long. But then the, I was excited to learn about, but I thought at the end of the day, this is still the West. America is in the West, right? It would be funny if you want to study Eastern music at the end of the, in the core. And the professors like who has a problem with calling the Western civilization like art, and then every single one of them all lifting their hands because they were saying there are so many artists who are greater than Beethoven and Mozart. We silence them, erase them all, and that's why we have to now end up studying these like bigots, you know, who are racist. And I'm like, and then they were like looking at me, why are you not putting your hands up? somebody who doesn't have the problem with talking about Western civilization. So that's just like, I was like, do I even have to do this to graduate? And that was, a, of course, necessary to do that course to graduate. So every, every class had an element of being a politically correct and shaping you how you think. And I learned how to censor myself so well at the Columbia. And then I was freaked out one day. I was like, what am I doing? This is now I escape, you know? It just... And I'm so, I'm so, I'm so <laughs> ashamed of that. 
That's so awful. I can't believe it. You know, it's no, it's no picnic to watch these great institutions hang themselves. Yeah. It's, I, I literally felt like it's a suicide of civilization. Like we are killing ourselves here and and that's why, like, what, I mean, that's what scares me is that when I was so grateful to going to South Korea was, outside of North Korea, there was at least a place that was left to be free. And all these people obsessed with fighting for, you know, climate change, animals rights, gender equality, transgender, whatever, all these things people are fighting for, wonderful. But then imagine when nobody's free in this world, who's gonna fight for us? And that's like what terror for me is like, imagine all of us became enslaved, like North Koreans, all of us did in that system. There's no one can stand up for any of us. And I guess because I'm always, I always knew that it wasn't guaranteed. Like when I go to camping with my friends, my friends somehow always have confidence that they're gonna find food, even though when they're going to the remote area. Not me, I always packing this like energy bars, blah, 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 always with me because I know like you can end up not having ever all the food. So maybe this is a mentality that in the West, freedom was always there. Somehow people think it's gonna be miraculous, they're gonna be always there. And for me, it's like, no, it can be not there. That's, you know, that's why we were supposed to be educating young people. We were supposed to be teaching them that, no, it's not always there. It's, it's fragile and you better take care of it because the default condition is authoritarian starvation. And if that isn't happening, it's a bloody miracle. Yeah, that is. And that's, that's where I am at right now with North Korea. Why, of course, I'm fighting for my people's freedom, but there's so much interest in, like even Hollywood they do not want to stand up anything behind the thing is challenging Chinese Communist Party no mainstream no Hollywood stars no nobody in America want to be behind the movement that challenges Chinese Communist Party well and I've seen this over and over in the universities too you know it was often the case that it was my psychology classes where the students learned about what happened in Stalinist Soviet Union and Maoist China, they hadn't been taught at all. They hadn't been taught that tens of millions of people died in China. They hadn't been taught about what happened in North Korea. They hadn't been taught about what happened in Russia. It was like that never existed, even though the Cold War was all about that. And it was, it, it's appalling. It's, and and I, I think you, you see exactly the same thing while well, you're pointing out exactly the same thing. How blind can we possibly be? I know, is it? The people say like, oh, Hitler killed so many people, but do you know actually Mao killed the most human beings on earth? He killed like 50 to 60 million people. The Chinese communism killed more people than anybody ever did in our human history. And yes, and the Chinese still... Communist Party still controls China. And the only reason people aren't starving to death there now is because they adopted, by, b because they had no choice, essentially, because because people did start to rebel to some degree. They introduced free market transformations. It's the only reason that China has emerged as powerful economically as it is. Yeah. So what's next for you? You're, you're, you've graduated from Columbia. When did mm -hmm. you graduate? Uh, January of 2000, uh, last I go, year. I got to ask you year. again. I got to ask you again. There, wasn't there at least one course that you took there yeah. taught by someone that taught you what you wanted to learn? One course. Where you is... should know. Like, if, if there was, you'd know. You'd I, know. I, I knew... I liked about the evolution class, about how the humans, uh, we became who we are. Uh, you know, going through you know, homo erectism, homo, like have this all that humanity journey. But then, of course, they always had a political correctness element, always in the textbook, everywhere. So 
there's not, I like the economic classes a lot because it really helped me understand how the world worked in some other ways. But then, of course, it's all about like the payment, gender inequality, payments, blah, blah, all that like macroeconomics has that thing. So, it, it, I mean, it, I think it filtered it out. It was, it was good, but I don't think it was worth of that amount of money, especially, and the effort to go. You can't take them on like online. This Look, case. I had professors. I had lots of professors who were great. Like I went to this little college when I was 18, uh, 17, I guess, because that's when I went to college. And it was just an adventure for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I got uh, the, the people who taught me. I had an English professor. Um, uh, his name escapes me at the moment, unfortunately. Dennis Wheeler was my political science professor. I learned, I remember that from 30 years ago. Um, I can't remember my English professor's name, unfortunately. I had a philosophy professor named Langenbach like six or seven professors. And it was a small college. It wasn't an elite institution. Um, and they loved to teach. And I had a group of friends that loved to learn. And it was great. Like, it was great. I learned a tremendous amount. I learned that I didn't know how to write. And they <laughs> taught me. Uh, Robin, Robin Burke, that was the English professor's name. He gave me a D on my first paper. It shocked <laughs> me to death because I'd got good marks in high school. And I didn't know what I was doing, and he pointed it out and helped me learn to to write. And these people were very serious. They were. We walked through Plato and Aristotle and and Hobbes and Rousseau and the full breadth of of Western philosophy, and 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 it was exciting. And and there was no politically correct nonsense. And that doesn't mean that it didn't cover the political spectrum. A lot of my professors were democratic socialists not all of them but plenty of them were so they covered the political spectrum so and and i would say too when when i was at harvard and at the university of toronto for that matter that there were no shortage of professors who were providing genuine education that wasn't contaminated with propagandistic nonsense and so i'm i'm stunned to hear that you can't bring to mind a single example from your four years that where you got... See, you should have been exposed to people that had the same effect on you as George Orwell's Animal Farm. At least people who walked you through literature of that caliber and who had respect for it. That, the, at minimum, you should have got that. Yeah, but they said to me not to read Jane or... Uh... Jane here because they had a colonial mindset that's gonna brainwash you, you know, without you knowing it. So the problems of reading the Western classic is they were all like bigots and racist and believed in slavery. So uh, it was because it's I an love... amazing, it's an amazingly, yeah. it's a it's a lie that's so profound that it's absolutely staggering. It's staggering to me. To hear again, even though I've been watching this for the last 20 years, watching it develop, it's staggering to me that it's that that this can actually be the case that that that's what ta what's taught about this tradition that actually produced the first emergence from slavery that's ever existed anywhere. I know it is like we we in in North Korea history was forgotten. Like we, our history begins when Kim Il Sung was born, <laughs> and everything before we don't even know what Big Bang was. We don't even know who Shakespeare is. Like we don't know who Romeo and Juliet is. And everything was forgotten, other than Kim's revolutionary history. And when I came out, what I loved about was that the continuation of life, that life before Kim's, that was amazing. There was things beforehand, way, way beforehand. It was very humbling to those people who thought through things. And you were talking about uh, Plato. I read the Plato's on love and how he brings his people talk about discussing what love is each mean for them. And it gave me so much like just insights, you know, to understanding humanity. But now- Yeah, well, that was kind of the point. <laughs> I know, but going to Colombia, the first thing is like, who loves Jane here? Like, I, I said, like, yes, but do you know the problem? Is like, no, do you know that she believed in all those like ideas back then of colonializing other people, countries, and how that embedded in her literature work? And that's what, like, whoa, I mean, uh, 
Uh, I mean, so they expect everyone in the history to think the same way they do right now at this point, exact same time. And if yeah, they which don't, is to me- which is to basically memorize, you know, twenty platitudes that anyone intelligent can can memorize in fifteen minutes, and then to dismiss the entire world of knowledge. These books, when you were reading Orwell, and when you were in that little room in North Korea or in mm-hmm. South Korea, and you had all those books, what were you reading? So Orwell affected you. Who else? You've you're, you're, you've read now. Who, who's affected you? It's in a lot of ways. I remember the 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 Siddhartha, the novel is a fictional novel. Uh, he, Hesse. Yeah, Hesse. That book really gave me a lot of <laughs> comfort and to think my how to think of my own journey and how how what kind of things I need to focus in on. Like I could be focusing on, oh my God, what I went through, that could, that was very horrible. Or what could I focusing on? So I read a lot of classical books, actually. And I think now I'm thinking it was actually a good thing. I didn't pick up this political correctness books, but rather going to time way before then, like 18th century, a lot of literatures. So I think a lot of books shaped me in some a lot, many, many different ways. And now to this day, I was just saying like reading your book was, of course you heard that many million times, but uh, it was, you know, people say like, you read to know that you are not alone. And that's the thing when I was reading your book, it just reminded me of that, the struggle, that shared struggle that we have on earth. Regardless, you're born in North Korea, in America, there's still people kill themselves in America. Life is unbearable for anyone. It gave me a lot of compassion because after coming from North Korea to go to New York, like right, all my 70% of my friends going to therapy. And they tell me, I mean, you gotta go to therapy. And I was like, what is therapy? And of course, coming from North Korea, what do I what do you know what trauma is even? And back then I was like, the word the fact that you know what trauma is, like you are so privileged. You don't need the therapy. <laughs> That's how harsh I was. And I wasn't able to empathize with my friends in New York. Like they would go in line for two hours to get into this like delicious like restaurant. And food to me was always quantity. It was not about quality. It's like, why would I be sitting here with you for two hours and get in the line, right? And, and just understanding all of those like layers of, you know, emotions and that was that's why i'm very grateful for your book and how you shaped me 